what we're finding is those athletes do not want to share their secrets, which is why no one knows about it, right? So if you got you got an edge on something, you don't want the other guy to know about it, and so they they don't advertise that they're doing this. Although that pitcher did, and yeah. We actually got a lot of phone calls after uh, that guy went. He was on WGN and talked about his success. He's in our feedback, so. So Pete is doing the uh, coaching aspect. So it's not just coaching with narrow feedback, that's certainly a big part of it, but it's also uh, professional coaching in terms of if you go to a, a life coach for uh, any other you know, reasons, you're having um, parts of your life you're not fi feeling fulfilled, you're trying to set goals and you know, uh, look toward the future, figure yourself out. Life coaching is an awesome thing to do and narrow feedback is an uh, addition to your coaching. Next slide. So, um, Dr. Laura, Mr. Pete, we have a tech here, Nick, who's talking about Everybody. Yeah, it's Nick, and then Lori uh, Pounce over here. She's also a musician. She's our senior tech. She's board certified in uh, neural feedback. I'm also board certified in neural feedback. It's important to mention that, not just, you know, we want to brag as much as there's, there's no regulation on neural feedback, so anybody can kind of open up a clinic and put a shingle on the wall, so to speak, and say they're a neural feedback specialist. The things that sets those people who can buy a, a gizmo on eBay from us is that we're trained in a professional way. We have standards and guidelines that we follow uh, for clean, and basic things like cleanliness and making good connections. We're dealing with really small bits of electricity and we need to make sure we're uh, actually measuring what we say we're measuring, and it takes a, a qualified tech. So uh, our, we have a couple techs that are qualified, um, and that's Lori Senior. And we have a couple other techs, and they're working today, so they're not here. So that's our, our teams. Oh, do you know this guy? George Carlin? If you're looking for self-help, why would you read a book written by somebody else? George Carlin? Am I the only one who remembers him? Alright, so what's neurofeedback? I'm going to break it, but it's just as simple as it can get. Neurofeedback, two parts of the same word. Neuro has to do with your brain activity. Um, there's a bunch of uh, nerve cells in our brain. When the nerve cells talk to each other, there's a chemical exchange that happens from one nerve cell to the other. We all know that there's a chemical exchange because psychiatrists tell us. You know, that's, psychiatry really deals more with the chemistry of the brain, whereas neurofeedback deals with electricity, and it's exactly the same process. When one, when you do anything, your nerve cells are, are talking to each other, getting yourself to do that, and there's a little bit of electrical uh, transfer in that process. The electricity is in microvolts. Anybody, microvolts, anybody, physics people? How, how much is a microvolt? Thousands of volts. Good guess. It's a millionth oh, of a volt. Yeah. It's a millionth of a volt. Yeah. So we're talking about the teeniest little piece of yeah. electricity yeah. coming off your brain cells. It's very small. And the electricity is coming from, you know, there's, uh, if, I, if you follow my finger up near the back of my throat, there's something back there called the thalamus in the brain. I'm not going to quiz you guys on this stuff. But that's where the electrical signal kind of originates in the thalamus. And we're talking about a microvolt, a millionth of a volt, moving from this area in the middle of your head all the way up of all the tissue and through the skull and through the skin and your hair and your product in your hair, and we're reading it uh, with a small cap. So we're dealing with very, very tiny bits of electricity, but the point of it is that um, we can read the electricity there, compare your data, we can take a picture, and we'll, we'll do a demonstration in a minute, uh, we'll put the cap on someone's head, put some conductive gel into the sensors of the cap, and read those itty bitty little uh, parts of electricity. And we can compare one individual's results to somebody, someone, we actually have a database of uh, normal brains. So brains that we know that do not have any uh, brain disease, no uh, psychiatric issues, no head injury, um, nothing out of, uh, that would be considered clinically uh, dysregulated. So we're going to compare one individual's results, the person who's here for the test, against a normal database. And we can make comparisons and say, compared to a normal brain of somebody your age, here are the parts that are dysregulated. Here are the things that are out of bounds. And we, we make a picture out of that. And in the beginning, all the way for people to come, uh, we, we saw uh, you know, pictures of dysregulated brains. And we'll, we'll get to one in a second. So neuro is the little bits of electricity released when nerve cells 
in the brain talk to each other. That's the neural part of things. And this is exactly what I already said. Sensors read the electrical pattern from your brain. And this is important, especially you know, when I get to talking a little too much you know, with the clients and I start kidding around. Uh, people think that we're giving electricity to you. We're not giving electricity to you. We're not doing anything at all like that. We're reading the existing electrical activity that's coming out of your brain. Um, we're not, you know, our job is not to hurt you. Or, or um, I always think of that Bugs Bunny um, episode where it's Bug, Bugs Bunny changes the, the scientist's head to a chicken. You guys remember that? I just remember that before. We're, we're reading from you and we're not changing you into a different character or anything like that. Um, and we can, basically what I already said, we can take a picture based on, on the electricity, the patterns that we uh, read. So the feedback, um, and you're all already talked about, feedback is we plug your data live into a computer, and then the computer feeds back to you or talks to you, tells you when your brain is calmer or in a healthier pattern. So the computer knows because it's comparing your results against healthy brains, saying, hey, you know what, here's a part of the brain that's not so healthy. Um, let's try to, the goal would be to get it closer to, to better health. Um, and so we're, we're actually not doing anything. The information is fed back to you. You see it, and we'll do it in a minute. You actually see your own brain activity on the computer screen. And you can try to uh, influence your own brain, brain activity, and that's the point. The brain actually trains itself. We're not actually doing anything. We're running the equipment, and we know what a voxel is and all that stuff, you know, Dallas. Um, but really, it's you looking at a computer screen um, and trying to correct. I just had an image of, have you guys seen um, uh, com computer-assisted golf swings? That's feedback, right? You go to one of those places, I can't remember. I haven't been to those in a long time, but whatever. You can get a yeah, get a, a video camera on you watching your golf swing, and you can see some feedback on the screen saying, hey, turn your wrist this way. And that's exactly what it is. You're training yourself to have a better golf swing. And that's exactly what this is. You're reading the feedback um, when, and the other point is that your brain's not always dysregulated. So people who come up with anxiety or ADHD or any other kind of dysregulation, um, they're not always, and you have to get to know me in my sense of humor, they're not always a mess. Like you're, you're not always having anxiety, you're not always having ADHD symptoms. Your brain moves in and out of normal all the time. So it, it's an ongoing, it's a live process. It's not just one snapshot. Um, MRI, by the way, is one snapshot. So when you, when you take, this has better, our equipment actually has better uh, temporal, which means time, uh, imaging than an MRI because it takes it over time and averages things. Um, but, but my point was that our brain goes into normal and when your brain gets normal, you're gonna get some feedback saying, hey, that's a good ball swing. And when it doesn't, you know, you're doing, doing it off, off center, then you'll get feedback, hey, not so good. Okay, Psych 101. So someone said they had Psych 101 in here, you guys, right? Um, Pavlov's dog, who can explain Pavlov's dog? Well, I find my coffee. Anybody? Ping. Anybody? Take a cup of coffee for the, cup of coffee. for the fine doctor. Yeah, that'd be great. Who has a dog? It's right there. I have a dog. Have a dog? I'm the only one with a dog. Come on, you guys got a dog. It's okay. basically training. Okay, it's explain. It's, what um, have you trained your dog to do? Well, I can't love using the belt to mm -hmm. train the dog on how to react to the mm -hmm. sound of the belt. Mm -hmm. And it was sad every time you rang the bell, the dog would do the same thing. Right. Okay. So who's got a real life example of how they've trained their pet? Sid. Okay. And would sit. <laughs> okay. Was, my dog, I, I, mm -hmm. I do this when I'm outside, the dog's barking at somebody. Yeah. I snap my fingers, I go like this, and she okay. comes and sits by me. Okay. Yeah. That's cool. How long did it take? A week. Yeah. In a week of what? I mean, the, the obvious. I know I'm saying right. the obvious, but just taking her outside. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Just over and over and over yeah. again for however many repetitive, times. Repetitive. Repetitive. Yeah. Right. Repeat. 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 Right. We have some teachers in here too, right? Oh, we have teachers. <laughs> uh, how do you how do you do this with humans? Can Same you, thing. It's you all mind, repetitive. Mind sharing what kind of teacher you are? Um, it's, it's complex. Sorry. It's yeah. well, from a psychology perspective, mm -hmm. um, I, I have kids who are anxious about 
performing from the crowd. Can no I say you're a drum teacher? Pardon? Can I, do you mind if I share that you're a drum teacher? Sure. He's a drum teacher. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> um, <laughs> business teacher too. But, yeah, I was going to say that. You have yeah. to let you pick. Okay. But it's uh, perform that you have performance anxiety, and, and the first question I asked him was, "How do you eat an elephant?" And they had no idea. It's like one bite at a time. And you see this big elephant in the room, and you think, "I got to eat this thing." No, you got to learn these parts. And once you have these parts down through repetition, you'll be able to play that. You'll be able to perform in front of the crowd without it bothering you. Mm -hmm. But right now, what you're seeing is a challenge, and it's you're creating this problem, self-induced problem in your head before you even start. Mm -hmm. And so we talk a lot about that, and we get it. And it's just, I give them, then I give them the roadmap on how to practice, mm -hmm. what to practice, and how to get to where they're mm -hmm. so going. Let me, let me make the parallel, and I'm making this very loosely just to kind of make my point. What you're describing as far as how you are uh, instructing with your students, your, your drum students, that's more kind of the instruction I would do in psychotherapy mm -hmm. back in my day in psychotherapy. It's more consciously telling them, here, this is what you want to do, here's how you do it. And you know, you go through this process, and add a boy, and, and it'll it'll work out for you. You know, by your side, it, it's going to work. Just try try these things. I know what I'm saying. And, and here, here you go, practice these things. So that would be a, like the conscious side of learning, right? The unconscious side. How you trained your dog? Um, she would bark at it. I I would have. It first started where I would yell, and then I realized that me yelling was kind of like her barking. So she positive. thought we were yeah. both yelling at the neighbor. Yeah. So I had to train her to stop yeah. because I didn't want the neighbors to not like my dog, Correct. right? So I uh, I would pull her and I would just have her sit and yeah. then I would just point my finger and that would, she would realize that what I wanted her to do is come and just sit by me. Okay. She doesn't have to protect me. And that was kind of her realizing then she didn't have to protect me. So there was me. an implicit reward there, right? right? Like well, yeah, it was an angry girl. Yeah, you know? oh, yeah, there you go, right. that's her mom, right? Yeah. Yeah. Her. Okay. Yeah. And um, again, not to beat a dead horse or whatever, but uh, anyone else train their dog to do anything interesting? Cat, dog, bird, parents, children? <laughs> we were all children. Okay. Okay. So I, think, Laura, I think mine's trained me. All right, Dr. Laura uh, has a dining table, and my poor dog uh, has to live with a psychologist who trains people and everybody else. Um, my dog sits next to me in the dining room table during dinner. Um, I pulled out the chair, so every time I sit down, I pull out the chair, um, and my dog will sit up there, and he will sit with a tears on face and wait till dinner's over until we say, that'll do, or your excuse, something like that, your excuse, and he'll get down, he'll get his treat by the, by the back door. So it's reward-based learning. Um, I did not tell him, hey, I need you up in the chair. Um, what I did is wait till he naturally moved by the chair, and naturally put his paw in the chair. So each little successive thing that he did for me, I rewarded him. Um, when I first got him, he couldn't do stairs. Long story how I got him, whatever. He couldn't climb stairs. And it was just one treat on every stair all the way up the stairs. And probably like in your situation, it took about a week or something, rewarding him every little stair. And eventually he's zooming up and down the stairs. And he still gets, the, you know, this is years ago. He still gets to the bottom of the stairs and, and wherever he is, and he just is all excited. You don't have to make the stairs. Um, so it's reward-based learning, and it's not, it doesn't rely on language. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. Is that reward-based learning is unconscious, it's procedural, and it does, does not need your conscious participation. It's more of a passive thing. Um, my car has taught me to buckle my seatbelt. Does anyone have a beep in their car when they have your belt on? My car has trained me, not that I know as a grown up and uh, you know, uh, Dr. Laura knows to put her seatbelt on, you know, and get in crashes while your belt on and, and whatever, um, of course. Um, before I tell myself to buckle my seat, my hand is already buckling. You know what I'm saying? Like the, the ding has unconsciously trained me to grab it because I don't like the ding. And we do things like that all the time. It, it's, it might be easier to think of some examples of how you've trained your animals, your dog, whatever, and it's harder to you know, go through your entire day and figure out how the environment has trained you. There, it happens all the time. That uh, seatbelt is a prime example. You have a good mm -hmm. example. Go ahead. Driving. Okay. When you drive to the same place mm -hmm. all the time, mm -hmm. there's times where I'm driving. It's like 
I don't remember the last three miles. Right. <laughs> I don't remember how I got from right. here to there. The entire drive yeah. is unconscious. Right. Right. And, and it's reward-based learning. Hey, I didn't die doing this. I get where I'm going. I don't need to pay attention. Right. I have all these habits already piled up, and, and um, I'm, already, I'm already doing what I need to do. I will wake up when a ball rolls in the street or the light changes or something, but for the most part, I can do this unconsciously. Drumming, we have a, a disabled bass player here. We have another drummer. Um, guitar people. And all of the instruments that are played are unconscious. Well, there's some conscious learning. You tell yourself what book you have to open up, or you know how many times you practice the, the lead or whatever. But most of uh, that type of learning is unconscious. So um, neurofeedback is repetitive reward-based learning. And you are going to ask, what are the rewards? I'll tell you right now. Uh, nope, it doesn't play. I didn't have a slide for that. But the rewards are basically. Um, we have people, we have a, a library or a catalog of movies. We have hundreds of movies. We have Netflix. We have um, Amazon Prime. We have a, a large uh, external hard drive with, uh, loaded with movies. Um, we play a movie for you. The computer knows when your brain's doing the healthy thing, the calm thing, and the movie plays. And when your brain goes out of bounds, it stops playing. It's a reward-based learning. And so people come in, sit in a comfortable couch, put some equipment on their, their scalp, um, and it feeds into the computer, and the, the feedback is to the person. I want to see the movie, it's what I'm here to do, it's you know, the one part of participation you want to consciously uh, involved in, but the, the movie plays uh, when, when it is rewarding your brain and it stops when it doesn't. And repeat, repeat, repeat in about 10 sessions, whatever we were trying to train you to do has, I'll use the word permanently in kind of a uh, dramatic sense, it permanently sticks, just like you practice the golf swing over and over again, or the, the drum drum beat, or the guitar solo, or the bass riff. Um, you repeat it enough times, you know, knock on wood, it, you know, it sticks. Uh, for for most, most situations, most animals, that's, that's animal-based, reward-based learning. Um, so that's what neurofeedback is. We're, we're training, while well, you're training yourself to improve your brain functioning, um, and when your brain's functioning better, your symptoms are going to get better. Achieve your goals. Um, Nick, I was talking to Nick this my time in Arlington Heights, and I said, hey, you know, we're, we're getting this information together for the talk, and hey, here are my slides, I'm ready to go. Can you look up what sports teams, you know, uh, use neurofeedback? And he came up with a couple. couple who is the musician? Um, Rachel Dagger. Who's the great drummer? Taylor Swift's drummer. Who's that? Taylor Swift's drummer. Taylor Swift's drummer? Yeah. Who's Taylor Swift's drummer? Uh, yeah. uh, okay, so who's, yeah. Who's Taylor Swift? <laughs> she was sweeping the floors a while ago. No. <laughs> Very swiftly. Moving along. <clears throat> Moving along, okay. Um, so without thinking, without going through any of my files, we had somebody who came in yesterday to get a final exam. And what I mean by final exam, we, we did a before picture 10 sessions ago, so t 10 actual feedback sessions uh, on the left, and I won't go into all the the complete explanation about all this stuff. Um, basically, red, not good. Um, mean, in, by not good, it means it's significantly different than our average brain uh, population uh, by three standard deviations, which is a lot. Um, puts you in like a one f uh, first percentile category of deviation. I'm getting too far off the thing, I know. But basically, red, not good. So this is t uh, 10 sessions ago, lots of red in the front. That's the nose, those are ears and the sides, looking down at these head models. Um, and I know that there's dysregulation across the front. And I can get fancy and say I know dysregulation on the right hand side has to do with anxiety. We have an amygdala there, basically a fight or flight mechanism there. Her fight or flight mechanism was operating very slowly, under functioning. Uh, so she did have a lot of manifest symptoms, anxiety, a lot of worry, a lot of physical symptoms, tightness in the chest. Um, panic attacks, things like that. Uh, when there's red up on the left, a little depression, uh, and I can go on to some other stuff, but basically anxiety, depression, some other things, 10 sessions ago. And I didn't have to look that hard for this thing. She was just there, we did our exam. 10 sessions later, the red's gone, for the most part. So how, how long did it take to get that scan? To get the scan, we're gonna do, that, do one scan right now, so you'll find out for yourself. Oh, all right. About five minutes. So patience. 
patients. And, and that's actually my point is, you know, you can do a five minute scan in kind of the before and after things. Um, whereas my neuropsyche valves take 12 hours. So it's pretty uh, incredible what kind of technology we have available. It's not being used. It, uh, a lot of the reason this te technology isn't used very much is because um, it's expensive. People don't know how to use it. People are so accustomed to uh, doing their Google diagnosis. And um, many, in, you know, in psychiatry, not just Google, but psychiatrists diagnose off the checklist all the time. You, you know, Tell me your symptoms, you got anxiety, you got uh, some worry, your, your heart pounds, shortness of breath, okay, great, you have uh, anxiety, here's a pill, over and done. That only takes a few minutes, I guess. Um, but it's not uh, objective at all. There's nothing objective in the current way that psychiatrists are diagnosing. Um, and so the other reason that we're not more familiar with this kind of technology is politically. Like, the psychiatrists don't want this out there, the drug companies don't want this out there. Um, it's a short-term uh, solution. And again, I'm not trying to sell snake oil. I'm not saying this is the perfect thing for every single condition. That's not the point. As much as, boy, what if it could be useful? What if you do have side effects and can't use medication? Um, here's an alternative thing for you. Why not try it? If it's 10 sessions and this particular individual did well, what if it worked for you? You know, I kind of uh, phrase it that way rather than any kind of promise like we have this magic, you know, bean thing here, with, with, which it isn't. Um, but anyway, things, things can clear up here pretty quickly. And that's a bunch of mumbo jumbo saying, I, I don't like these slides. I put it in there because my dentist somebody might ask these kind of questions. <coughs> um, is it efficacious? Does it work? Um, it's hard to define what it means when something works. You know, someone who is in psychotherapy, does it work? I guess. How long does it take you to, if you came into psychotherapy with anxiety, how long will it take you to get better? To be honest with you, I don't know. It, it takes a while. That, you know, that, that's kind of the answer. If you take a pill, you might feel the effect right away. So pills are probably efficacious, but again, you have some negative uh, downsides to medication. Um, the research studies on neural feedback are, to be honest, pretty weak because the drug companies aren't buying, you know, you know we, we don't have loads and gobs of money uh, in the neurofeedback community to um, run um, rigorous uh, research and we just kind of rely on anecdotal data and the people who are clinicians, to be honest with you, they, of air quotes, they don't care. Like, they, they know it works in their populations, they, they, they're helping the people they're helping and they're not in the business of trying to prove to anybody what they're doing is valid and I, I think that's the other half of it. It's just a different mindset altogether and they're, they're not in these huge, you know, uh, political wars with trying to defend themselves and saying that they're this great, uh, you know, uh, greatest thing that came to mental health uh, kind of statement. So, but aside from from that, commonly reported success rates of 60 80 percent are seen in the scientific literature, with up to 90 percent reported in QEEG based intervention uh, using strict criteria of total remission of the complaint in the 50 to 60% range, whereas if you got a positive benefit, 80 to 90%. And I think that's what we see. And we, we, we see a lot of people. We probably see know, 45 um, sessions, I'll just say, a week. And that is actually our response. Would you guys say the techs who are working with me, that people are mostly are producing, that they're generally getting a positive benefit and their symptoms are subsiding. The slide I have with the before and after, that person absolutely said, yeah, I, I improved uh, in terms of my anxiety symptoms. I'm sleeping better, I'm thinking better, I'm doing better at work, I'm more focused, I'm less distressed. And so that's the kind of things people are saying. Um, Can I so ask a question? Yeah, of course, of course you yeah. can. So after the 10 sessions, sure. the red was gone, right. it's staying gone? Or that is, is the point, right. So te technically the red should, your quotes, should stay gone. If I, you know, train my dog, you know, so many times to sit in the chair next to me, does he always sit there? Not all the time, but for the most part he does, especially if I kind of got him back in there. So the, the point is, yeah, the behavior is is solid, solidly learned. Um, sometimes it takes more than 10. Like that's, it, it, I'll, I'll be honest, that's an unusual for, you know, for 10 to look that great. Um, that might be one of the more unusual cases. Sometimes it takes 20 to, to look that great. Um, and, but the point is, yeah, once the sessions are done, you're done. Like you don't have to come back for booster sessions necessarily. 
Um, my mentor, who's been in the field for uh, I think 50 years, like since the on, you know, the, yeah, the onset of neurofeedback, he lives up in Minneapolis, and uh, he actually trains the uh, uh, Philharmonics, the Minneapolis Philharmonics, and the, the uh, coaching that we were talking about before. But anyway, he, he was saying um, his practice is really dwindling down. Partly, he's, he's retiring, but the other part is he's he's hit all the people in his neighborhood, like all the people who are going to get this. Um, have already gotten it, they've done their 10 or 20 or whatever, it could be up to 30 sessions, 30, 40 even, but he's done their sessions and he, he doesn't have any more clientele if they're done. Like psychiatrists, they have, you know, jobs for life kind of thing, whereas with this stuff, it's kind of short term and people, you know, turn over because they're done and they kind of move on their thing. So yeah, the, in, in theory and in our experience that, you know, once they're done with those sessions, that's it. There, there's an outdoor caveat on there, this is just kind of a side point that, once the, the training sessions are done, there is something called alpha th theta training, and um, it's a kind of a bonus 10 sessions of a, a type of training that we do that I'll say locks in the training. It keeps people in a learning mode, like, um, uh, you don't have to necessarily get into all this, but um, theta is that state of mind that you're in right before you fall asleep, okay? Um, and my theta is about three seconds, like I'm, I'm out. And then when I wake up, I'm actually, my theta on the way up, I'm, I'm up in three seconds and I'm running around uh, quickly in the mornings. But anyway, theta is very few seconds and some people have a harder time or a longer time falling asleep. But when we do um, alpha theta training after those clinical sessions, we keep people in that theta mode for about 20 minutes. And if you guys know anything about um, uh, how our brains learn, maybe you wouldn't, but um, when right before we fall asleep, right when we wake up that's when we learn the best so if you're going to try to learn anything this is why hypnosis works is on your way down on your way falling asleep if you implant i'll just use that language implant a message i do this all the time i hate alarm clocks with a passion and i haven't used one i didn't use one this morning i don't use one when i'm catching a plane um i do this method right before i fall asleep laura you got a meeting in the morning wake up at six laura you got a plane in the morning wake up at five and i will tell myself that right on the way to sleep and I will wake up at not 459, 501, I wake up at 500. It's a, your brain learns it then. I was telling that story to somebody who was um, from the country, India, and he said in that culture, um, they have a, a tradition that's called punch the pillow. Have you guys heard about this? Um, you set an intention right before you fall asleep, you punch the pillow with whatever, that, that's what I said, I gotta pick up the laundry in the morning, I gotta go to the dentist, whatever give the intention right before you fall asleep and you wake up and it kind of gets seated in a, in a deeper place in terms of learning. Anyway, uh, once the clinical training, uh, this individual who had the before and after looked really nice, we offered her 10 sessions of this alpha theta training, she'd come back for two more. Um, and to be honest, a lot of people don't want to leave. Like they enjoy it, like they, they, they feel benefit from it. They, um, there, there's something about it that, uh, it, it's also, you know, there, there's an aspect of this that it, it's not just for, I would say the same thing. We're not just plugging people in like a lamp. Like we're not just putting stuff on their head, plugging them in and walking away, and we'll, we'll see you in a half hour. Um, I'm a psychologist. I've been working for 25 years. I know psychology. I know therapy. I know behavior management. I know you know what are all the other parts of psychotherapy. So I'm coming into this with, as a psychologist, not just as a physics person who you know going to plug you in and, and see what what cool colors come up on your map. So it's, it's a more of a wide range service and uh, with the coaching aspect of things that we just kind of hit things from all angles trying to, trying to improve your you know, success all, all the way around. So, so there's an end game to it. Um, can you touch on really quickly about brain brightening? Brain the seniors out there that are worried about brain dementia. Brain. Yeah, yeah. So again, studies and you know, how much money does this field have for running studies and whatever. Um, a lot of studies have been done in PTSD, by the way. Uh, my mentor at Bradley, I'm not answering your question yet, mentor at Bradley uh, University, um, she has actually uh, uh, started this field in terms of something called neurotherapy, where you combine traditional cognitive behavioral therapy with neurofeedback. So it's actually kind of a hand in glove uh, uh, type of training. Um, so and she's run tons of uh, research studies on PTSD with veterans and other reasons people have PTSD have those. Um, and, and we have tons of research on people working with the elderly. The elderly populations are getting older. Uh, our mom was in the hospital a while ago and we were at the ICU, whatever, she's fine now. But the point is when we were talking to all the, the staff at the time, they're like, we are just overflowing with people. People are getting older and older. They're not, you know, they're not, in a bad way. They're not, they're not dying because they're living longer. 
people are living in their 90s and, and what are we going to do with these things? It with, you know, where do we house them? That's one problem. But the other problem is, yeah, you can get into things like dementia and neurofeedback um, studies uh, dealing with dementia. You can um, get a type of training called brain brightening that if you get that, like once every three months over the age of 80 or something like that, you can ward off dementia by a significant uh, probability. So that's, it's not on my list or the list, but um, yeah, it keeps use with dementia and, and keeping your brain healthy uh, as we age. So it's cool stuff. Yeah, I mean, there's so many places we can plug this in. You can plug it into a nursing home, you can plug it into a school system, you can plug it into a, uh, a research facility for sure. Uh, rehab, we have people sign um, contracts saying, um, I might, it's in there. You might lose your interest in your drug of choice. Even if you're a teetotaler, have a glass of wine on the holidays kind of thing, you may lose your interest in your glass of wine. And we have people complain, uh, I had one gentleman, I keep telling the story, he lets me tell it. Um, he, he'd go out with his friends over the summer, he'd go to a Cubs game or whatever, his friends want to go out and have a beer or two. And he wasn't, a, he, he had a lot of other issues, whatever, but he wasn't a, a, a substance dependent. Um, but he's, he did not want to drink. He's like, I was out with my friends, I was drinking, having a good time, and I was like the stick on the wall, I didn't want to drink. He was complaining, I'm like, well, then we got some other things to talk about, but it's interesting that um, not only so we're talking about dementia, post-traumatic stress, but also addiction. Uh, it's we have teenagers, I think this is kind of the, makes the point, teenagers who, who stop smoking pot. Like, that's not what they're there for. If they're there for something else, anxiety or whatever, that's probably why they're smoking pot. But they'll come in, I'll say, complaining that, boy, you know, I, I stopped smoking pot. Like, really? That's interesting. Um, so, yeah, a lot of applications for sure. Anybody want to see it in life? See it in demo? I do, I do, I do. Yeah, three people I know. <laughs> yeah, three people I know. So we're going to switch gears. Lori's going to uh, put a sensor cap on Nick's head. So I Nick and Jeff you. are going to switch places if they could. Okay. And Lori's going to show you the process. Sure. Okay. Thanks. Oh, you want me to bio trace or no? Yeah, okay, bio trace. Keep it simple for me. What do we, we got going we on over here? here? Confidential stuff out of the way, and I'll put it up on the screen. Gloves. Cap. Yeah, help yourself. Yeah, coughing. <laughs> That, this machine right here, Dr. Laura, yes, sir. that used to take up an entire room. Yeah, anyone here of the Amen clinics? Dr. Amen, right? You're not a family member, that's okay. Um, good, good guy. Um, but he, and he's recording, so I'm speaking. Yes, be nice. He's very neutral. Um, he purchased a spec scan machine, which fits the size of this room. And he purchased it back in the, I don't know, no one, 80s or early 90s probably. Uh, the machine uh, is humongous. You have to uh, ingest some kind of dye for the uh, imaging to work. And it's huge, it's costly, the maintenance is costly, etc. And um, once you buy a spec machine, like you can't sell it on eBay. Like you can it, right? So he's got a spec machine going up the side of the room. And the technology for us, luckily, is this thing. So we're able to take some uh, pretty high quality uh, images using a very small amplifier. And amplifiers is what it sounds like. I was talking about microvolts. You have uh, one millionth of a volt that we're trying to isolate um, coming out, out of the middle of your head. And this amplifies the signal so that we can actually see it on a screen. So, so, so the brain's got 40 watts of... You can fire up a refrigerator bulb with your head. Yes, yeah, so 40 watts of electricity coming off of your head, and we can plug you into a refrigerator, and hopefully you can see the, the cookies in the back. Right? That's right. Okay, so what, what Lori's doing here, she's got a soft cap. It's a nylon, what's what's her? Yeah, that'd be great. Okay. Okay. Lights for dark for this. Uh, right. Everybody shield drives, lights, oh, that's right, okay. So she's got a soft cap, she's putting it on his head, um, it has 19 uh, little sensors on there. She's going to line it up. There's a, a system, of course, where uh, you want to have those sensors sitting and a little Velcro at the bottom to keep it in place, making sure he's not in pain. Looks like no. Uh, make sure his ears are sticking out of the holes. Lovely. 
Uh, every kid who comes in wants a selfie of this, so you're going to see kids all over the Facebook with selfies of, of themselves in these uh, air caps. Um, my, my theme at work is an uh, airplane theme, um, and so in, in space, this is what looks like an airplane cap. Um, so what she's doing, uh, she's squirting conductive gel into the little sensors. It's a saline solution, so basically salt water gel. Uh, looks like a needle. Um, it's actually not a pointy needle. It's a flat, blunt needle. Um, you can poke it on your hand pretty strongly. You're not going to cut yourself. Our job is not to break any skin. Yeah, um, yeah see. Um, now you're going to put your cooties in his head at you. Um, uh, um, putting the saline gel in there, and we're looking for connections, trying to pick up those microvolts of uh, electricity. I think we can start showing it on the screen. And yeah, she's just going to take a picture. She's pretty quick. It takes her a couple minutes to fill out the little sensor. Very good piper. Cool. She's a good piper. Has anyone watching the uh, Food Channel Christmas cookie right now? <laughs> oh, I have too. You've been watching the cookie? Yes, I have. So what does that what does that solution do, Lori? It's a saline solution, so it helps take better pictures. It's more so, conductive. So it connects. Yeah, it's electricity better. running off your head and running away unless it gets uh, uh, stuck in your Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, good, Lori. So on the screen is what the brain are you done? No. She's got a couple more to go. And we'll split it the light stake down after she's done. Loading off with the gel. Great signal. Bite down. Oh. Yeah, hang on a sec. Alright, sorry. Get ahead of ourselves. Okay, can I turn the lights down? Yep. Okay, lights going down. <laughs> so what we have up on the screen, it took her, what, three or four minutes to put the gel into the cap there. Um, each one of these waves of data, lines of data, represents uh, the individual sensors in the cap, locations on the brain. The, the waves running across the top are in the front region, and the ones back here, uh, I'll slip it over here, the, your, your vision's in the back of your head, so your vision's down here. Uh, parietal lobe, which is in the back. Uh, temporal lobe's on the side, and the front's up on top. So uh, it's very sensitive, like we were talking about microvolts and how much, you know, how, how sensitive this equipment has to be to amplify the uh, reading. Nick, go ahead and blink your eyes for us. Okay, so those are actual eye blinks. Uh, your, your eyeballs are dipoles, and you create a little elect electrical uh, uh, change when you change your eyes. Uh, bite down with your teeth for us, okay. So it is that immediate telling you uh, we have some tension for sure in the eyeballs. Um, so that's, that's the reading. So it's EEG technology, electroencephalogram, again, the same thing that, that you, same exact test that you take at a hospital for getting a seizure study or sleep disorder study. Um, to be honest, our technology is actually more advanced. Has anyone had a seizure study or sleep study at a hospital recently? If you haven't, the, um, what it is, they're at the hospital when you go, they're little metallic cups with a wire hanging out, and they put gel, or uh, actually a paste, and put 20 little cups on your head. Whereas this is a cap and gel and it's a lot quicker, whatever. We're actually a little bit more advanced. Um, what we're looking at, and I don't want to kind of waste all the time on you know, the science and stuff that may not be relevant right now, but um, who said they knew what a Hertz was? One of you guys, Hertz? Hertz Donut. Hertz Donut, Hertz Rent a Car. Uh, Hertz is how many waves per second, okay? Mm -hmm. How many times does this wave wave? So there's a wave, there's a wave, there's a wave, one, two, three waves in whatever period of time. That's a Hertz. The point is, when you have slower waves, if there's fewer waves per second, so 
Uh, fewer waves per second, that's a slow wave. It means that part of the brain is underactive. When you have fast waves, that part of the brain is overactive. And so that's kind of what we're looking for, is what part of the brain is doing what it's supposed to do, and what part of the brain is overacting. Um, and so let me shift into, can you do, Lori, the um, narrow maps? Sandy Firetrace, so go F, F, T, and do the arrow. Okay, do the arrow again. Do the home. Do your signal library. And Q, E, E, G, and narrow maps. So this is map in real time. So clearly he's got a big red blob on his right hand. So. Um, so everybody starts out with a lot of red. Um, everybody's going to have red. Like our, our brains aren't always you know these perfect machines all the time, and, and you move in and out of normal all the time. And the point's going to be is how long do you stay in the abnormal place? And if we were to average out all your data, what's the most dominant thing happening? So you can have red all the time. There's going to be red in the front because he's blinking his eyes and, and doing stuff like that. Um, but this is a, a real time thing. And so, um, you know, at this point, we're just taking a picture. Like, uh, we have people have their eyes closed for about five minutes. We're not going to take the next picture. We've got to do somewhere else. We'll show you a, a, a sample picture after we're done. But this is all it is for, for the imaging. We can watch it in real time. We can have Nick do different things. Close your eyes for us, Nick. If you tell me to keep your eyes closed. Uh, keep an eye, everyone who's watching, on this part of the back of the brain when the, when the eyes close. Open them up again. Okay, close them. Keep them close, Boris. Basically, the alpha wave um, is our awake and alert wave. When we close our eyes, we our alpha moves to the back of our head, basically. So I can tell just by looking at one part of his head what, he, what his eyes are doing. What he's thinking about when you close your eyes, your imagination uh, kind of runs in the back of the head. So we can actually, for this is this interesting side note, if we're doing psychotherapy, we can, this is like a lie detector test or a therapy kind of thing. Like, you know, I, I can, you know, tease him a little bit and say, you know, tell me about, or, or not even, don't tell us anything, but think about your biggest fear. Our projector's on fire. I'm just kidding. Okay. Um, and do stuff like that. Now, now imagine a relaxing scene. Beta's the fast waves over here. Think about the anxiety thing again. Yeah, so anxiety is going to be lighting up up here, and then when he relaxes. So anyway, that's feedback to me as a therapist, how to kind of work with him, and he can work with himself and learning different things about his brain. So I can talk to you all day about all the cool things that you're looking at over here, but the point is it's pretty quick to set up. It's giving me as a clinician, neuropsychologist, a lot of data of what's happening in your brain. A lot more data than, you know, again, your, your uh, psychiatrist for sure. It's a lot more data than, than uh, your counselor. And um, what we're about to do uh, is pretty interesting, too. Can we set him up for a training? Can we set him up to, no, we're going to set him up for a um, neurofeedback training. So what we're going to do is have him train to um, run an airplane with his head. Say what? That's right. He's going to play a video game where an airplane flies through the using only his brain waves. Piper Cuff? Yeah. You can stop thinking about your worst fear. Okay. Being on Facebook. Any questions while we're waiting for the software to do what it needs to do? Is this, those of you who are never heard of or really haven't heard much about neurofeedback, is this what you thought it was? Kind of, sort of, yeah, maybe what you thought it was.
does that cap feel? The cap is uh, not really that bad. It's fine. Interesting. I'm sorry. It's comfortable. Cotton. Alexa, <laughs> tell us a joke. Yeah. <laughs> that was pretty good. Course all ready to go. Mm-hmm. Monitor two, and then do what? Okay. So Nick, you're flying. So uh, there's no way to turn off this light at the top. We would have done that. Like see some of these graphics, but um, as we know, hands and we program the computer to give him rewards when his brain does what we program the computer to help him do. So you know, for example, if he's here for ADHD or for anxiety or depression or a pain condition, we have people with tinnitus, migraines, um, we uh, program the computer to reward him when the brain is doing a healthy thing. And he racks up points, his job is to get his airplane through the target there with all the people watching him. Um, and it's just repetitive training. And it's actually 20 minutes. Anything longer is actually too much brain actually can't handle any longer than that. And we, we would do it longer, we tried it longer. Oh, 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 there we go, there we go. That was outstanding. Right um, so land? yeah, what's that? Can you, land you can't land them, no, we're just doing them on the targets. <laughs> okay, so Nick, can you explain what you're doing? Um, I'm trying to focus, I'm trying to really find that like middle ground between Focusing and trying too hard and just kind of getting the that balance, you know, that perfect little so calm and aware okay. state of mind. Okay. So are you trying to visually force the I'm, point? I'm, I'm trying to kind of like feel my feel my brain in a way. I'm trying to feel the changes of when it's not getting the reward and when it is getting the reward for like so for there. Trying to hold on, trying to hold on to that feeling, and then it goes away. And I, I don't really have much control over that, but just kind of maintain that that state right there. So, generally speaking, you know, Nick works for us and knows exactly what's going on in his end right now. But the new people coming in who are starting their training, they really don't know what they're supposed to be doing, and that's actually the point 
Um, the little kids who come in, they actually do much better than the grown-ups because uh, the kids aren't trying to do anything. They're not trying to micromanage it or guide it with their thoughts or, you know, again, do that psychotherapy. I'm going to talk to you and make this better. This is not about talking to yourself. It's not about micromanaging uh, your performance as much as letting your brain train itself. Letting your brain, it's kind of like when you, good job. When you ask somebody, uh, how did you learn to ride a bike? Like, can you put that into words? I mean, like, you remember when you learned to ride a bike. But riding a bike is not something you, you tell yourself. You can't read a book and learn how to ride a bike. It's something you do. It's implicit. It's unconscious. It's nonverbal. And that's what kind of training this is getting after. So people sitting there, I just tell them to kind of be passive, be curious, be aware, um, and notice what happens when your, the plane goes to the hoop. But it's not that person consciously doing much of anything. But short of what he said, you know, be calm and try to stay, uh, you know, know some what's going on. But it's really your brain, brain doing the training. And so, yeah, 20 minutes of this. Question, is it following your eyes or no, just your no. thoughts? It's, it's not your thoughts, it's your brain waves. It's, so. it's catching when your brain is doing the normal thing, it, it lets the plane go toward the, the, the basket okay. or the target. So it's those brain waves, the pattern is they're reading, and when the, the pattern is getting closer to the norm, then it then moves the plane. So it's not anything you're doing with your eyes, nothing you're doing consciously, actually. And that's the hardest thing to explain is how much learning we do procedurally, and it's not within our executive control. And I, I could kind of lecture a little bit about, you know, as human beings, we think we are you know, above the animals in a lot of ways because we have this conscious thought, but you know, if you think about it, animals have been around in terms of evolution for millions of years. Humans have only been around for about 10 minutes. And it's the animals that have all the, uh, the, the, the genetic programming um, and behavior base, and they don't need language. They don't need to talk to themselves when they're not doing stuff. Um, real quick, uh, I was watching a, um, uh, was it Nova, I think, and there was a guy he was an oceanographer in Alaska, a long, weird story, but the bottom line is, there's more weirdness to the story, but bottom line is he brought an octopus into his living room. He got a, 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 a tank, a water tank, and he wanted to study octopus, octopi, whatever the word is. And he put the octopus in the, in the living room, and he had a daughter, and I'm well, uh, sorry. The octopus became a daughter's pet, whatever. Um, the interesting thing, though, is that why I kept it on instead of falling asleep was, uh, do you know what octopi eat for snacks? And those who already know, because I told you don't answer, but... Children? Yes. No, just kidding. Um, <laughs> <laughs> crap. Hard shell crab. And I, that would be the last thing I would think of. So anyway, uh, an, a, 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 a soft shell crab is a reward for an octopus. Um, and they took a crab, put it into a ball jar, twisted the cap on there, put some water in there, uh, dropped it into the tank. Guess what the octopus did? Figured out how to open it. So how big of a brain and how many brain waves and how many cat, whatever, how many uh, voxels in, in his brain image could he possibly have? Um, you know, octopus brain like that, but he learned how to unscrew a jar in a uh, tank. Um, have anyone seen the crow videos on YouTube? Go to YouTube, just type in crow videos. There's one. Um, there's a, a, in Japan, there's this uh, intersection where there's uh, st you know, streets and cross lights and, um, and traffic moving along. And there happens to be walnut trees at this intersection. Um, a crow, and there's a lot of crows that do this, they pluck a walnut out of the tree, fly over the intersection, drop the walnut into the intersection where cars are passing. They go to the uh, crosswalk, wait for the light to change. When the light changes, the car stop, they walk out in the crosswalk and eat the walnut. Okay, so that's a very complex uh, set of behaviors that's nonverbal. It's not the crow saying, okay, here's what you got to do, buddy, today. You need to eat and feed your family. You need to do all these things and crosswalk. And when it's yellow, there's no language in a crow. There's no complex language in a crow. So it's all nonverbal learning. So what he's doing even while I'm talking, even in a group of people, even whether he's talking to himself, trying to coach himself or not, his brain is learning how to get the plane through the, 
uh, target there, just like the octopus learns to unscrew the, the ball jar, and the crow learns how to <coughs> crack the walnut in the intersection of the pan. Can we, can we show how binge watching can help improve our brain? Just watching a video, just how it pixelates or what? You want to yeah. see his brain on, on the brain activity the as he's doing the game? And oh, his brain activity is his main Okay. And then we'll be closing down, but. No, I was just saying no, the. Uh, we all like to watch Netflix, so if you want to watch your peaky blinders. You can improve yourself. Mm -hmm. You mean do a training with the movie? Yeah, instead of the plane, just a, oh, a quick, see, see, a quick pixelation, just to. Yeah, so um, I was showing the brains in the beginning, like a way for people to kind of come in. In the technology, we have um, a, a box. So you guys know what a pixel is, the little squares on the TV that like, tells you how, how grainy or how in tune your picture is on the TV. Those are pixels. Voxels have to do with uh, areas of volume on a screen, or areas of volume that you can pick up in terms of brain. Uh, density and um, we have the newest technology that shows the cerebellum it's in the back in the, we're not on the screen but um, autism uh, affects the right side of the brain and it affects the cerebellum and there's my eyes but it's um, so how does it help kids with autism we have tons of kids that come with autism uh, we've had a couple that were nonverbal that became verbal uh, during Probably 20, I'm thinking about 20 sessions a week. Uh, a couple kids, yeah, to get to when we were talking. But yeah, cerebellum is involved in uh, motor development. It's involved in uh, behavior disorders like bipolar. It's involved in schizophrenia. It's involved in language. I actually have a chapter in a cerebellum and language book uh, talking all about how uh, cerebellum is involved there. And the point is, we have a specific technology to do cerebellum training. So what Nick is doing over there is. Uh, doing what people, you got them on uh, my Greek wedding? Yeah. Yeah. So it's hard to see the light on like that, but when his brain is in the zone, the movie picture opens up, and when it's not, the lens actually closes in. So what he did there was got the picture to open up, and that's a reward to him that his brain's doing the right thing, and again, when his brain isn't in that zone, the picture will close up. And Lori has the, the uh, yeah, make it harder on the kid. Yeah, the buttons over there to yeah, add weights onto cool. the weight set. So she can, yeah. as, as he masters a level, she can turn up the heat on him, so to speak, and make it harder for him to open the window. So you know there's a movie going on, and I got this little pinhole, but with him getting into the zone, getting his brain regulated properly, the movie will open up. And once he gets it open, uh, we'll stop all the demonstration, answer questions, which I know you said again. Nick, pressure's on you. Come on, man. I want to watch a movie. My big group I'm sure that's very motivating to me. Here it comes. There we go. go. Oh, nice. Okay. Love it. Okay. Way to go, Nick. Right. So that's the other kinds of trainings you can get. Thank you. Um, so we got the video game with the airplane. Um, there's some carnival games where you can throw balls, uh, swing a baseball bat, pitch a baseball, throw basketballs, uh, be a field um, a goalie in a hockey. Uh, all these movies we have, again, is Netflix and YouTube and um, Amazon Prime, and we have a, a library of other videos that we can get into. So that's neurofeedback. Um, what questions do you have? How can I... Make this more accessible to you. <laughs>
Brian had a story about. Uh, no, I got a question first. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, you <coughs> show people going from a standard deviation below yes. to normal. Does it work to go above the standard deviation, like a normal standard deviation? Well, so the the reds are three standard deviation. I'll say too hot. One of those maps are red and, and yellow and green and whatever. Red means it's too hot. Blue means it's too cold. So you can do three standard deviations the other direction. So meaning they're getting too sciencey on you guys. But red means hyperprofusion, a lot of oxygen in the blood uh, vessels around the uh, nerve cells, um, a lot of activity going on there versus hypoperfusion, which is not a lot of uh, oxygen in those areas. Um, and maybe what you're asking more about though is can you um, get even better at whatever you're trying to perform? So if you're being a drummer or an athlete, how can you uh, keep going? What, what you do in that case actually is you um, turn up the focus part of your brain. You like turn up the electricity, and again, it's not me doing it, it's you, you, you training yourself to turn the electricity up on a certain part of your brain that's responsible for focus and laser vision. Um, turn, uh, tuning into what you're doing and turning off all the other stuff. So it's kind of an ADHD training in, in, in some ways, but it's more uh, specific where, you know, if someone's learning a, they're gonna get a, a golf swing, it's running through the golf swing in their mind, there's ways to put the cap on, it's a small amplifier, and actually literally, physically um, practice the golf swing uh, while you're training that particular part of the brain. And so it's exercising it over and over again turning up the electricity, turning up the, the connections in that area so that your performance continues to improve. So it's, it's just repetitive training. And, and, and the more, I mean, there, there's a limit to how much electricity you want to have in a certain area before it becomes too irritating. But there, there's a sweet spot to um, uh, keeping the training and the repetitions going. Call it getting to the zone. Yeah, the zone, yeah, exactly, yeah. You're it, able to create a tone. It's a laser, yourself. yep. Yeah. Yep, yep, exactly. Other questions? about the quad copper. Oh, MIT did something like that instead of VR. Um, they did it where, it, setting? Yeah, where yeah. they could actually fly it based on your brain, uh, like thinking of certain things. And so they based yeah. it off of whether you like your hands open same, or closed. And it's like the exact thing. same technology. Yeah, um, there's a connect home study. I wish my neurologist friend came to the gym. But um, where they actually, uh, we had it planned in the beginning. <coughs> they could trace the, the highways, the pathways in the brain uh, communicating with each other, and um, they look like little st strings of, actually strings of different connections to the, the sections of the brain. Yeah, they spent billions of dollars to do what they call a connect home study. And they um, translate each um, firing area of the, each connect, connection of the brain firing with different locations to an actual brain behavior. So uh, tons of studies have occurred into taking a look at these kind of pictures. Elon Musk is messing around with this a di different... Elon Musk is a... Uh, what Elon Musk wants to do... Does anybody know what Elon Musk wants to do? He wants to... So we have these little leads that we're putting on the head. There's 19 of them. There's some more advanced ones that can be up to 120. Elon Musk wants to go into an individual nerve cell and so, like literally with a, some kind of microscopic sewing machine, 10,000 leads onto an individual nerve cell. A, how do you isolate a nerve cell without killing somebody? B, how do you get a sewing machine that small that could, and so an electrode onto a nerve cell? And C, Why? go do something else. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> Why, exactly. We're doing kind of the same thing. So um, these are the connect cones here. Lauren, can you, up on the networks, can you like do the autism one for some of the So 
we now know that, yeah, that there's networks involved in the different conditions. So again, nowadays we diagnose people based on checklists. Um, that's how psychiatrists will diagnose autism. If you have symptom A, B, C, D, um, Dr. Laura would diagnose them this way. Hey, how is this network working for you? Um, is it uh, abnormal or isn't it? And that's, there's just much uh, cleaner data. So, um, what, um, when it comes to pain, I know in the beginning you showed what it looks like with the full through of the pain. So, do the pain, like, does it correspond with a specific um, part of the body when you're in pain? Yeah, you know, that's, that's where kind of the clinical stuff kind of comes in, kind of teasing out the different things that can go into a pain or these complaints. So, pain can be. Um, Something, you know, damaged part of your body for sure, and there's a signal that goes to the pleasure sensors that say, hey, we're not having pleasure, this is pain, and so you're gonna have a, a picture that looks like that. A lot of times, and this is you know, based on my, my reading and, and other kind of research, that um, pain is actually related to an OCD kind of um, condition where people cannot let go of the experience. They're holding on to the experience in a repetitive way and it doesn't let go, so what we actually do and some of the pain conditions is actually true for OCD and the pain condition, um, the, the focus comes off of it. I think we can all relate to that is if you, if you hurt yourself during the day and you're doing a lot of things to keep yourself busy and not focused on the pain, you may not notice how much pain you're in until you go lay down. So when you go lay down and all your attention is onto the pain and you're thinking out of your head and it, uh, and it eats away at you at night. Um, and so what we do when it's a certain pain condition is, is kind of deal with the attention aspect of it and, um, and it'll correct that. So we have to know we're going to look at the, the uh, anxiety uh, network for a person with pain. We look at the actual pain network. Are there other things kind of going on that are showing pain? Um, so good question. Yeah, I mean, so clinically you have to kind of, kind of think it through, not necessarily when they you know, rely on the, the graph. I'll show you. Does insurance pay for any of this at all? Yes, okay. it does. So that's the addiction network. Let me, so the people who didn't see this before, uh, it's just cool technology. Yeah, so the here's the front of the brain up here. The back is back here. Here's across the side. We are looking down at the top, so this is right down the center. So when I hit addiction, yes, the entire frontal lobe uh, lights up. Nothing's going on in the back. It's also uh, the reward centers and the pleasure centers are up in the front, and that's why we have an addiction picture there. Anxiety is more global, uh, deals with the back and the front and the sides. Uh, attention, uh, dorsal, there's whatever, I can annoy you guys with all my knowledge on anxiety and ADHD because I've done a lot of research on it, but there's different anxiety networks involved um, in ADHD, that's a dorsal which is where attention, where is something, ventral is what, uh, what is it, that's a different kind of attention system. Autism spectrum disorder is largely in the right hemisphere, dealing with the cerebellum back here. Someone used the word cerebellum. Where's my cerebellum? Oh, we don't, cerebellum's over here. Uh, what else can we show you? Executive face recognition. A lot of your brain's involved in identifying faces. You need to know friend or foe, so you're using a lot of your brain to figure out. Do it's I know this power. person or don't I? Language is left hemisphere, that should not surprise you. Um, memory is gonna be everywhere. Mood is in the front. Pain has a lot in the back. Pleasure's in the front. Schizophrenia, tinnitus. So, yeah, so super cool things we can do with understanding how your brain's going. And it's not just, you know, back when I was in school, it was just one location um, did one thing, and we've advanced so far beyond that with these networks and, and um, this kind of imaging, it, it, it's remarkable. So it's not just one, one part of your brain does one thing, one part is connected to something else, and they're looped together, and you need the whole thing to survive and produce these kind of symptoms. What's a sleeping brain? A sleeping brain has a lot of slow wave delta, and so. Um, what about R the REM? Uh, one through four. Oops, excuse me. One one through four hertz is a delta wave, and so 
uh, that top head is a delta wave. So is anyone wearing a cap? No, this is a recording. So whoever was wearing this cap had a lot of front, frontal delta show up. Uh, that does mean that they could have dozed off for a second while they were taking the test. So yeah, I can tell you if you're sleeping. I can tell you if you're good and bad. And what about kids taking Adderall to study? Don't do it. Um, um, it does, I mean, answer two ways. One is we don't want our folks on any stimulants while they're taking these, uh, doing neural feedback because it throws out the results. Um, one in three people um, malinger with their uh, ADHD diagnosis. What does that mean? They fake. So it's very, we all know, whoever we are, whatever background we have, we all know how to fake an interview with a doctor to figure out how to get Ritalin. What do we tell them? How do you get Ritalin? Uh, Not just, yeah, what do you tell a doctor? Let's say you're going to a doctor and you want to get some Ritalin. What do, you, what, do you, what do you say is wrong with you? Can't pay attention. Can't pay attention, what else? Can't sit still, what else? Really anxious. I'm anxious, what else, right? So um, I'm having trouble focusing, I can't study. I go up to the room and I can't remember what I went in there for. I get sidetracked, um, all of that stuff. If you say those four or five things to a doctor, you can get some Ritalin. And, the, and I think that it's making my point here is that how do you know you have ADHD based on telling the doctor something? Um, that's one thing, because we have an objective way of, of telling that. Um, and then the other thing, like I said, one in three people are faking ADHD so they can get their meds. And that's, that's a lot. And so how, do you, how does a doctor know the difference? I don't know whether they, uh, like they, they, don't, they don't care, but they don't realize, or I don't know what, what the deal is. But um, yeah, there's a lot of medications running around out there uh, based on very subjective um, information. Um, and yeah, what does the stimulant do to your brain? And I don't know. What does it do to your brain? Do we know? I don't know. Fries and egg. Fries and egg. Everyone's probably done, right? Any other questions? Yeah. Um, so, like in the sense of like anxiety or depression, yeah. somebody could be going, two people could be going through the exact same thing, one person thinks it's true, one person doesn't. Right. So, does this show like the degree at which like something is, because we obviously see red, green, or blue, is there a degree within between for you to see that somebody's from two patients and you see something that affects them, like going through the same thing, how much of the response is? On, off, or? Uh, yeah, you can, you can actually, going back to the microvolts, you can actually put a, a reading on there and find out exactly how much electricity is at whatever, whatever wave. There's so many ways to chop up your CO. You can put a pointer on there and find out that that's like 13 microvolts or something. And so in the anxious situation, over the amygdala, the anxiety center, you have 13 microvolts here, we put it on you, and you only got 10 microvolts. So you're, you're shooting out less electricity in that area than the other person. And then the, the question can be like, what is a normal microvolt for someone who is being chased by a dog or whatever, who's anxious? Um, uh, and there'll be an average number to that. You can compare your, your results against normal, or we can compare your results against other things that do make you anxious. Maybe you're not anxious for dogs chasing you, but maybe you're anxious when you have to take a math test or a geography test or something like that. So yeah, there, there's all sorts of ways, subjectively and comparatively, that you can uh, look at all these things. So it's a lot simpler. So that's all there is. Hey, we want to use it to help people. I mean, that's I think the bottom line is what else we got. You know, yes, psychotherapy, which helps to a degree, but there's just also the, the rest of your brain that isn't being used in psychotherapy. I think that's the point. This part of our brain that's more animalistic and, and more um, instinct-based that we don't pay much attention to in therapy medication doesn't do that at all. So this is the other half of the equation. It's, it's what you consciously tell yourself to do while you're learning, but unconsciously, what it, you know, how, how are you working against yourself unconsciously while you're trying to learn to do something? I'm also a musician, and I can tell you there's some conscious things I do to try to practice playing play guitar, conscious things I do practicing playing guitar, but there's some unconscious things that get in my way, and whether it's, you know, uh, well, conscious things could be me saying, boy, you know, I'm, I'm no good at this, I, I need to stop playing, or boy, you know, why is this so hard, or you know, all those conscious things you say to yourself, but unconsciously, like, you know, what, what else could be playing around in the background that, that just gets in my way? And that's where, you know, these kind of techniques can, can be helpful in kind of getting at it. Um, you know, the 
in corrections. Other questions? Dr. Laura, outstanding. Yeah. <laughs> Process of whatever you need to do. J-A-N-S-O-N-S dot com. That's right. Over and out.